Welcome everyone to Nerd of the Rings. Today we have a very special guest with us, Mr. Gino Acevedo from Weta down in New Zealand. And you have seen his work all over the place. Um, most notably for the crowd here, I'm sure it will be from his days in Middle Earth. Gino, thank you so much for joining us today. You're welcome. Thanks for the invite. You know, I, I love I love your show. It's, it's been fun to uh, to watch your show and see a lot of old friends and colleagues on there. Awesome. Well, I'm glad that we could add you to the list, and uh, we're certainly honored to have you. Um, I know Jerry Vanderstelt uh, was one of those who was who was proud of me. He's like, you need to ask Gino. He's got some great stories. So no pressure, but <laughs> just Jerry. Jerry's hyped you up. He's your, he's a good hype man. <laughs> he's great. So, he's great. The one thing that I, I always like to start off interviews with asking people is how were you first introduced to Tolkien? Um, for me, it was probably, <clears throat> probably the Hobbit, you know, when I was, mm -hmm. when I was a kid, you know, growing up. And, um, I remember before I read the Hobbit, I remember seeing the, uh, the, uh, the animated, uh, Hobbit. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, um, you know, just loved all the characters and the, the, and the designs of everything. And, and, of course, you know, Gollum and everything and the trolls and, and all that. Um, and and then, of course, later on, you know, I read, read the book and stuff. I, I had never had a chance or just I, I could never get through the Lord of the Rings books. Uh, I'm not much of a reader. So I, I, yeah. I, I, I listened to them on tape, though. That's one thing I did do is like when I started over at, at Weta Workshop, with Richard uh, Taylor and the team, um, the BBC back in the seventies, I think they put out a, they put out a, uh, it was like a, a, almost like a play where they had all yeah. the different characters and everything. What I can't remember what they called it. Nin they, uh, 1981. They came out with the, oh, the radio okay. radio drama. Yep. That's what it was. Yeah. 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 And uh, produced by Brian Sibley. Yep. And um, I just fell in love with that. And I would listen to that while I was working on it. It's like how ironic this is. You know, I'm listening to this stuff and working on the film at the same time. And um, uh, I remember one time when I really had to stop and pinch myself because it was at the part uh, with Gollum. Mm -hmm. And I was designing a paint scheme of Gollum at the time. So I had the little Gollum head. Where is he? He's, uh, he's always over here. But, um, <laughs> but I was painting, painting this head. And uh, then the part of Gollum comes up and I thought, you know, I bet you I'm the only guy in the world right now who's, you know, listening to the to the radio play, but also in painting the Gollum, you know, the, the Gollum. The so it was a, a, a big pinch, you know, to, to make sure that I'm, I'm really awake, you know. Yeah. And uh, then, of course, you know, PJ would come through and uh, before I started painting him, uh, Peter would say, he says, you know, you know, out of all the things you've painted in your whole career, You've done some amazing stuff, but uh, this is going to be probably the most important <laughs> iconic character that you ever painted. It's like, yeah, no pressure, no pressure. <laughs> <laughs> and I guess that that held preach. I mean, it's hard to top Gollum as far as iconic characters go. Absolutely. Yeah. And um, it was interesting, just the whole process of the, all the different designs. Um, and Jamie Bez work was the, the lead uh, sculptor on, on Gollum. And Jamie is one of the... Uh, the craftsman over at what a workshop was just a brilliant artist and um but they had so many different designs and everything and they, it was also you know he was designed before andy circus you know was mm -hmm. on board and so it wasn't until after that when um they realized that uh, well they should incorporate some of andy's looks into into uh, golf yeah. you know because he was going to be playing the part of uh, of smeagol right and um so it was just it was it was brilliant and uh it just worked out so well as you know yeah absolutely so um <laughs> Take us back a bit, you know, tell us a bit about, uh, you know, how you came, you, you mentioned before we started recording that uh, you're an Arizona guy, originally from Arizona, and uh, you somehow found your way down to New Zealand where you've lived for uh, quite a while now. So how did, how did that happen? What's, what's, uh, what, what's the story there? Uh, well, it all kind of started with um, growing up in Phoenix, Arizona, <clears throat> and um, I've always had this love and passion for monsters and stuff. Um, and in fact, there used to be a TV show on Saturday mornings called The World Beyond. And The World Beyond would play the, the great classic universal movies, you know, Frankenstein, The Wolfman, The Creature from the Black Lagoon, and all that kind of stuff. And I was, I was glued to the TV uh, from 1030 to 12 o'clock every Saturday morning. And all my friends knew that Gina wasn't going to come out to play during that time because he had to go watch <laughs> the stupid movies. And uh, so afterwards, I go out and play. 
And <clears throat> I used to do a lot of drawing and sketching of, of monsters and stuff. I always had this fascination with them, as I said. And um, and Halloween, Halloween was my favorite time of the year, even 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 more so than at, than Christmas time. And um, it wasn't until um, I was I had graduated from high school, um, but before slightly before that, um, I was really good friends with my old seventh and eighth grade science teacher, Francis Reinprecht. And I used to take care of all his lab animals, all the snakes and lizards and all that kind of stuff that we had there. And um, I would even take care, I would even take care of him while I was still in high school. And um, and then um, one time, uh, Francis had a student teacher start with him. His name, her name was Patricia, Patricia yeah. Liff. And uh, <clears throat> she said that she just got married to this guy by the name of Larry Liff. And Larry owned a Halloween company called Imagineering. And Francis told her one day, he says, oh, one of my ex-students, Gino, he's, you know, really into monsters and the Dungeons and Dragons and all that kind of stuff. And, um, you know, uh, he's going to be graduating soon. You know, maybe he can go on, maybe you can set up a, like an interview uh, for Gino with, with your husband. And she goes, yeah, yeah, sure, she did that. And, uh, and she did. So I had graduated from high school and um, had gone over. I remember I remember I still had my, my, uh, my tan polyester, uh, three-piece suit from graduation, uh, you know, from, from the one from Sears, you know, and it was it was in it was in about this time of the year is in June, and June in Phoenix, Arizona is hot. Yeah, it's you know probably about 115 degrees or something. Anyways, I had a, a car that my parents had bought me. They bought me a little two-door uh, brown, uh, crappy little uh, Toyota Corolla, <laughs> but hey, it was a car. It was an AV car. It got me from point A to point B. And gave me that freedom. Anyways, and it, but the air conditioner was broken, so you just see had to roll down the window. So here I am in this in this three piece you know polyester suit, sweating my ass off, <laughs> driving to the interview, and I uh, got to go meet Larry. <clears throat> and um, uh, Larry had said he says, "Look, you know, at some point I want to start making some Halloween masks and stuff, but it's mm -hmm. not going to be for a while. You know, probably at least six months." So uh, he says, you know, I love your work and everything, but I, you know, there's, there's nothing I can really offer you right now. You know, the only jobs that we're giving out right now are, are in, in the, uh, on the floor, you know, manufacturing all this kind of stuff, you know, the, the old vampire blood, you know, I think everybody remembers playing around with that stuff. Oh yeah. And, um, and also another, another classic, you know, the, the oozing orb. <laughs> <laughs> so, and for me as a kid, you know, I grew up with that stuff, you know, always yeah. playing around with it and making myself up, making up my friends and stuff. And it was just like, I remember, never forget, you know, we walked onto the floor and the doors opened up and I felt like Charlie from Charlie and the Chocolate Factory, <laughs> where it was like the machines was making, were making the, the blood and the oozing orb and all this. And I was in heaven. And Larry said, well, this is, this is all I, I have to offer you, you know, at the moment. I said, it's, it's, it's pretty monotonous work and I don't know if you're going to like it. I said, yes, I will. Yes, I will. So I took the job. And, um, and so, you know, months would go by and I'd see Larry every now and then walk through the factory and I'd wave to him. I said, hi, Larry, I'm still here. I'm still here. And <laughs> so after the six months, he came out and grabbed me and I uh, says, wow, shit, you're still here. OK, well, you must be pretty serious about working here. So uh, we went to his office and he kind of told me about the things that he wanted to do as far as, you know, making uh, Halloween masks and, uh, and things like mm -hmm. that. And he gave me my own little room, my own little cupboard, my my little uh, my my laboratory, you know, <laughs> and, uh, where I can go and, and practice and and uh, and start creating some masks. Now, Larry had a friend um, by the name of Barry Coper, um, who was over in Los Angeles, and uh, oh, there's a picture of me with one, so, one of my one of my masks. Yeah. Okay, yeah. so this is from around that time. <laughs> it is, yeah. And oh, I miss that hair. I got to get that hair back. <laughs> <laughs> the '80s. Um, but Larry had this friend, Barry Coper, and Barry was a makeup artist in Los Angeles. In fact, he was head of makeup over at CBS Studios. And um, Barry would fly into Phoenix and, and do the makeups for the new catalog every year with all the new products and everything. And, um, you know, Larry told Barry about me and everything. So we got to meet and I was in awe meeting this, this guy, you know, who was, who was in Hollywood and, you know, worked with all these famous people. Um, but um, I think Barry saw a lot of himself in me when he was when he was my age. And so he kind of took me under his wing and taught me a lot about the makeup stuff and all that. So I would kind of assist him while he was doing, when he would do these uh, makeup uh, photo shoots. And Barry said, he says, well, you got to come out to LA sometime, you know, come, come, uh, come visit me and I'll take you around to some of the shops where you can meet people like, you know, the great Rick Baker, uh, Stan Winston, you know, all these kind of uh, amazing people. Um, <clears throat> now, just to backtrack a little bit, one of my favorite films of all time and still is, is it was the original Planet of the Apes. 
Mm, uh, yeah. You know, and I just grew up with that stuff. And I was always an, an ape fanatic anyway. So when that film came out, it just blew my mind with those films, I should say. Yeah. And, uh, <clears throat> and uh, I saw this documentary on uh, about the, the gentleman who developed the look and the material and everything that was used to make all the prosthetics and stuff. And his name was John Chambers. Uh, in fact, here I got a picture of him here. This is the, the great John Chambers here. And, um, and this documentary just blew me away because it showed how he would take a life cast and sculpt the pieces, mold it, and, and cast them out of a, a, a material, out of a foam, a foam rubber material, which is very soft and pliable. And um, he did a makeup on uh, Roddy McDowell and, you know, turned him into Cornelius. And that transformation was just incredible. And uh, what I really found amazing is that when you, and in fact, I still find it today when I'm doing a makeup and you put the appliance on and when you start putting the makeup on, um, you, you, you blend uh, the colors, you, you blend it from the appliance onto the skin to where you can't see what's what it all becomes one. Uh, yeah. And that's when the magic really happens. And that's when you can tell the actors really looking at you, looking in the mirror and really feeling like, Oh, this is pretty cool. You know? Yeah. <clears throat> um, and so anyways, um, you know, Barry and I became, you know, friends and I would go out to LA all the time to go visit him and he'd go out there for the weekend and stuff. And I'd come back and do my work during a week uh, at the Halloween company. And Barry was, you know, after a few years, Barry was saying, well, you should make a move out here. And I said, oh, no, 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 no. I, was, I, was, <laughs> you know, I still got a lot, a lot to learn. He said, well, you can learn it out here and stuff. And and one of the reasons why I didn't really, also didn't really want to go is because mom was, mom wasn't very well. She was sick with mm -hmm. cancer. And, um, and I was always afraid that something was going to happen, you know, and while I was away. And, um, but mom was always extremely supportive and saying, oh, you should go. You have an opportunity and a chance. This is, <clears throat> don't worry about me. Cause I had a younger, I've got a younger brother, Dino and a younger sister, Rosemary. I said, look, I've, I've got Dino and Rosemary here and nothing's going to happen. It'll be fine. So one time Barry called me and he said, he says, look, I've got a, a short gig for you. It's uh, only three weeks and it's over at NBC studios. And it's, uh, uh, Bob Scribner, who's head of the makeup over there has got a show that he's, he's working with uh, Dick Clark. Hmm. And uh, Dick Clark was doing this one-off show on a Friday night. It was called Friday Night Surprise. And it was kind of like, almost like the Carol Burnett kind of show where they had lots of different skits and stuff. Yeah. And uh, one of the skits that they had was a takeoff from an old show back in the 60s called uh, Masquerade. And what they would do is that they would have celebrities come on stage but these celebrities would be made up with makeup and prosthetics to look like other celebrities. So it was like an audience participation where through questions and stuff that the audience would have to guess, guess who they were. And so we were doing the same kind of thing. And so the uh, celebrities in this case uh, were the great uh, Alan Hale and Bob Denver, of course, from the Gilligan's Island, yeah. you know, Alan Hale playing the skipper and Bob Denver, of course, playing Gilligan. And <clears throat> for me, it just blew my mind. It's like, you know, I think first time I was really ever starstruck uh, by these guys, you know, and uh, and I, I loved actually loved the show. And I remember going into uh, into the makeup lab there, getting everything set up because on this particular day I had to take the life casts of both uh, Alan and Bob. And um, the first one that came in was uh, was Alan Hale, and he was just the sweetest guy, just like he is in, on the show. Uh, and uh, I explained the whole process, you know, I'm being very cool and calm, but inside I was going like, oh my God, it's a skipper. <laughs> and, uh, <clears throat> so he took his life cast, came out great. And um, then uh, Bob Denver came in and they hadn't seen each other in quite a few years. And uh, the first thing that Alan said to, to Bob was, little buddy, <laughs> which was his bad <laughs> right. like that on the show. And I just, I thought, oh, this is too much. <laughs> but anyways, uh, took Bob Denver's life cast and uh, so, Right away, I started sculpting the pieces, and I had to turn Alan Hale into uh, W.C. Fields. So I gave him a big nose, cheek pieces, and a chin. And <clears throat> Bob Denver had to turn him into a Mae West. Uh, oh, so that was like a full face thing. That was a real challenge. Yeah. Um, but they did a they did a skit from uh, the old show called My Little Chickadee, <clears throat> and uh, I'll have to send you some pictures of it. Yeah, and um, it was a uh, it was incredible. And then finish the show, mm -hmm. and I still had about a, a week left, I think. And um, uh, one of the one of the, the great artists that Barry had introduced me to was Dave Miller. Um, Dave Miller uh, did the original Nightmare on Elm Street and designed uh, the makeup on Freddy Krueger. <clears throat> but by this time, David, David was working on part five, which is called The Dream Child. And uh, <clears throat> David said, he says, look, I know you got a bit of time left before you go back to Imagineering. Uh, how'd you like to come work with me on, 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 on Freddy? It's yeah. like, yeah. <laughs> so I uh, went and did that for... Uh, 
uh, almost a week. But sadly, before I was uh, about to finish, I got a call that uh, my mom uh, had uh, passed away. And it was like, oh, it was like I knew it was going to happen. <clears throat> so um, I uh, never really got to say goodbye, but I did talk to her the night before. So that was, uh, you know, a bit of closure there. Um, anyways, I went back home and um, my uh, uh, brother and sister were there and uh, my dad came back. My parents were separated and dad came back into the picture and was, you know, helping to take care of a brother and sister for a while. And that didn't work out so well. So my sister went over to my grandparents and my brother just kind of went off on his own. I went to go live with a friend of his. And so there was really nothing left holding me back at all. And, yeah. um, and, and, and Larry from the Halloween company, who's like my, he's like my, my second father who was always going, said, you should go. He says, yeah, there's, there's nothing, there's nothing more here for you. It's like, it's, you know, you need to really go and expand your horizons and, and develop your skills and stuff. And, you know, again, that was something that Barry was always trying to do too, you know, to get me to come out. So I finally decided to, to move out there. So I went to go live with Barry, uh, for a while. And, um, so after, um, uh, uh, I think I went back and did a little bit more work on it with Dave Miller on the Nightmare on Elm Street. And then after that, um, I, one of the guys that I was working with, uh, Mitch Coughlin, who's another great artist, um, went to go work for these guys, uh, Tom and Alec, from a company called ADI, Amalgamated Dynamics Incorporated. And they were working on a movie called um, Tremors, you know, about the giant oh, worm yeah. in the desert. Coming out of the sand. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, fun, fun film. <clears throat> and um, they were about to finish that. And... Um, Mitch had told Alec and Tom about me because they had a, a new show coming up and they were, they were doing point break, the original one, uh, with Patrick Swayze. Right. And, uh, and, uh, and the other guys. And of course in the film, if you remember, they go rob banks and stuff, but they're wearing president masks. Mm -hmm. And so because of my mask making experience and stuff at the Halloween company, they hired me on the spot and uh, to do this. And so I sculpted the Jimmy Carter mask and, uh, <laughs> uh we had, uh, Kent Jones and Linda Frobos and, 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 uh, Yuri Everson sculpt the other masks. And, um, so that was kind of my, you know, uh, my second film there. And then, um, from that, they, they got the job, uh, of alien three. And, uh, and I, they could only take a, a, a small group there because the rest of the crew had to be English because they, they were going to film over at Pinewood Studios in, in, right. in London. And uh, I thought, oh, well, you know, they're never going to ask me to go because I'm just, you know, kind of a newbie starting. But they did. They asked. And it's like, and, and I'm a huge alien fanatic, as you can see. You know, where am I? Behind me here. Yeah, yeah. Alien stuff there. Um, and so I went out to work with them on, on Alien 3. Um, that was 89, 1990. Anyway, so jump ahead. I uh, came back and um, and I was working at a company called K and B Effects. And uh, did we talk about K and B already? I, I don't think that. so. No, no. Okay, so K and B Effects um, is the three initials from the the guys that own the company: uh, uh, Bob Kurtzman, uh, Greg Nicotero, and Howard Berger. The K and B there, and they were doing a show called um, Spawn. And it was uh, Todd McFarlane who was yep. a creator of Spawn, a comic book character. Yep. And they were doing a live action of it. And so Howard, Howard hired me to uh, to sculpt the, the suit along with another friend of mine, Bill Zahn. And uh, so we sculpted the suit and we were probably almost almost finished with the film, you know. And um, and Howard came to me one day and he said, he said, look, I've got these friends coming from this place called New Zealand. And uh, and I said, I don't think I've heard of it, you know. And, uh, and he said, well, they're... They they own a company there called Weta, and um, they do all the special makeup effects and everything for the Hercules and and Xena shows. And I said, oh yeah, I love those shows. And uh, he said, well, they're 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 wanting to recruit, you know, some artists to take them back to go work on a remake of King Kong. I said, they're going to remake King Kong, really? And they said, yeah. And I said, well, who's directing that? And he said, well, Peter Jackson. It's like don't know who Pete is, you know, and it's funny because Pete just lives down the hill from us here. Uh, but uh, anyways, so Richard said, says, look, we'd love to, because he knew that I was, I was a painter and designing the paint schemes and things uh, for both makeup and for characters and creatures and, and uh, suits and puppets and things. He said, look, we, we, that's one of the things that's lacking uh, with us right now is just some of these techniques that you, that you do. Uh, with painting stuff so we would love to hire you for your skills to teach us on how to how to do this kind of stuff and i says come out for three months you know see how you like working with us and um and how you know you you like working with us we like working with you and if it works out well then you know that's great you got you got a 
trip to New Zealand and get get to yeah. work with us. And um, and it was just like uh, I don't know because I was I was pretty pretty content working there in LA. I had I made a place for myself there. I was very happy. And uh, it was a lot of friends that you should just go try it. You know, it's only three months. And so, anyways, some a lot of a lot of time had gone by. And um, at, by then, I was working with uh, my friend uh, Patrick Totopoulos, and we were doing uh, uh, the Godzilla, the one with Matthew Broderick. Yeah. So this is probably 1997, I think, probably something like that. Mm -hmm. And um, so I was working with Patrick, and we were about three quarters of the way through. And, you know, and Richard, and I would always keep in touch. And he said, he says, well, look, um, unfortunately, the studios have decided to pull the plug on, on King Kong. He said, because because you guys are doing Godzilla and Rick Baker at the time was doing a, a remake of a movie called Mighty Joe Young. Yep. And um, and so the studio said, look, we don't want to make another giant creature, you know, destroying the city kind of thing or anything. So uh, they pull the plug on it. But Richard said, he says, but we have another project we'd love to bring out for. And uh, of course, it was that Lord of the Rings movie. Yeah. And so after I finished up uh, with Patrick, I, I jumped on a plane and um, uh, went out to New Zealand. You know, Richard picked me up from this little airport uh, in, uh, in Wellington <laughs> and took me to the shop and uh, the way to workshop there. And by this time, they had already started the pre-production on the show and uh, doing a lot of designs, mock, sculpting maquettes and, and uh, illustrations and things. And they had, you know, such amazing artists uh they're like alan lee and john howe it's like you've got alan lee and john howe here said, yeah come on come on upstairs and come meet them so it was just like because of course alan lee with his stuff in the, the book of fairies and uh john howe with all of his illustrations of uh you know of course all the lord of the Rings stuff that he's done right. and just everything in general um and, you know super nice guys and it just blew my mind and it just blew my mind with all the designs that they were doing and uh for me it was it was really interesting because Back in LA, I could usually tell, even if I didn't know who did, who designed something, I could usually tell who did it just because with mm -hmm. each shop and, and all the different artists, they had their own styles and everything, of course. Right. But in this case, everything was just so different and so new and so fresh. It was really exciting for me to, uh, to design the paint schemes, you know, for these characters and creatures. Yeah. Um, and so the first thing that I painted was the uh, head of the cave troll. Um, oh yeah. And, uh, so yeah. So that was a lot of fun. And, um, and then from there, just designing uh, the paint schemes for a lot of the the Urukai and you know the, the many orcs and um, oh, just tons of stuff. And uh, now, so that was sorry. Now did, did, I'm curious. Did you know when you flew to New Zealand? Um, did you know that uh, that they were working on Lord of the Rings, or did you not find that out until you got there? No, I, I knew I knew beforehand. Oh, you did. Okay. Yeah, yeah. I didn't know how secretive and, uh, they were at that yeah, point. It, it was supposed to be quite secret. And uh, I remember when Richard, you know, when he, when he told me, he says, but we have something else we want to bring you out for. Through the grapevine, I kind of heard murmurings of it being Lord of the Rings. And I remember asking Richard, is, is it Lord of the Rings? And he says, I can't tell you. <laughs> it is, <laughs> isn't it? It is. And he just went, well, you'll see. And of course it was. <laughs> Oh man! Now you uh, you mentioned orcs. I did. I'm I'm gonna try to work in some some fan questions that I uh, solicited from my viewers here. Um, I had uh, the Balrog of Morgoth is the username asks who is your favorite orc in prosthetics and why is it Jed Brophy? Which <laughs> makes me wonder if this is Jed Brophy's burner account or something, and he's just messing with us right now. Um, <laughs> But do you, you mentioned you do you did a lot of, uh, of Urukai and stuff? Do you do you have a favorite of the orcs that you did? It's a really hard one because we did so many. Um, but I uh, I have to say that uh, that Lawrence McQuarrie here was probably mm. my favorite, and of course his character is called Lertz, and um, and Lawrence is is a great guy, and uh, and we, we keep in touch all the time. He's like my 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 little brother because I'm a couple of years older than he is, um, but and he's he's a big guy. He's a couple inches taller than, than me. I'm I'm six three, so he's 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 very big. Yeah. And um, but Lawrence has like a, a this has happened a few times working with some of these actors. He has this but he has this amazing presence about him. Mm -hmm. um, anyway, when he comes into a room, but when he had all the makeup on and everything and all that, he had this incredible, powerful presence about him. I mean, you just knew that he was the leader. Yeah. Um, and something that's interesting is that when we first made him up, he didn't have the birthmark um, or the handprint on his on his face. 
Oh, um, yeah. And uh, the first time we see him was at Amon Hen, and when mm -hmm. we did the makeups, and he didn't have the birthmark of that stuff. And and uh, Peter saw the rushes that night, and he said, he says, oh, <clears throat> look, uh, Lawrence is just, he's he's blending in too much with all the other Urukai. We need to do something so that he stands out more. And um, so that's when Domini Till, a great friend of mine, an amazing artist, and we were doing uh, Lawrence together, <clears throat> and uh, we decided to give him the birthmark. So I painted that on, um, gave him a top knot for his hair, yep. Yep. <clears throat> and then also, <clears throat> excuse me, but then also with a, with a white hand of Sauron. Um, he's the only one that has it this way. Oh, uh, yeah. Like everybody else has it every other way, but yeah. he's the only one that has it that way. And it was actually, it was my hand. So I, I have the white was hand it really? of Sauron. Yeah. <laughs> didn't, didn't know Sauron was a, was a Mexican. <laughs> um, but yeah, but uh, but I think, you know, because we put him in the makeup so many times and um, uh, he was incredible. But uh, of course, you know, our great friend, Jed Brophy and Jed, if you're out there listening, hello, mate. And um, and Jed was another one who's a great one to put into makeups because there's a lot of actors, especially the ones who haven't worn prosthetics before. It's like it's a whole new layer of, 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 of skin. And uh, it's something that. You know, a lot of them hate it, you know, wearing it because I have to admit it's because like, I've worn it myself and it's like it's not my favorite thing to put on. But for a lot of people, and I'm, I'm talking about people like Lawrence and Jed, is that they really bring to life the character mm. um, because they, they're no longer. He's no longer Jed Brophy. He's he's yeah. whatever the character is. And he just becomes this like he, he played Snaga. Snaga yeah. was one of my favorite ones that he did. And then just he was just <laughs> he's really <laughs> creepy little guy. And uh, and uh so, you know, Jed is another one of one of my favorites and uh, it just goes on and on. There, yeah. there, there were just so many, you know. Now, you mentioned yourself in prosthetics. So naturally, <laughs> we've got to talk about this guy here. So tell us about this. Yeah. So this was, uh, of course, uh, being one of the Corsairs and um, and my uh, my now wife, but she was the casting director for Peter. Her name is uh, Liz Mullane. And um, so I think she saw me and she goes, he says, oh, I think we can use you, you know, and, and later on in the films of it being, you know, one of the Corsair pirates. And uh, I said, sure, I'd love that. And so it was one day and th there's a great uh, behind the scenes thing. It's on YouTube. and uh, 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 But it's uh, where we all got to play the Corsair pirates. And it was yeah. Peter Jackson, uh, Richard Taylor, myself, um, one of the producers. And um, and I think I think there was one one uh, other actor who was like the, a real actor, you know, yeah, not well, not one of us. And um, so we got we got to uh, play these characters and, and put on these these amazing costumes and stuff. And uh, my friend Tammy Lane, another brilliant makeup artist, did my make did my makeup. Um, and uh, you know, there's my hair. And I love the hair. I, I think I had hair like that in the '80s, you know. <laughs> And um, but anyways, I'll never forget we, on, on set, they had made a like a, a section of, of the ship, uh, the Corsair ship that you can see in the background there. Yep. And um, and we're all standing there. And because it's, it's the scene where the uh, army of the dead come out and they, they flood onto the boat that, you know, to come kill us, take us out. And so. It's uh, uh, Peter Dobby, I think, was the actor. Um, is talking with uh with aragorn you know and mm -hmm. and he says something aligned you know and whose army yeah you know yep. and, he says, and of course this army but we all had this to stand there and just kind of just look look mean and tough and everything yeah and um and then when they when we when we see peter said it's okay now when, when the uh when the army of the dead start coming onto the ship you have to look scared and just you know it was like you know really 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 frightened and so we were doing this thing we we're just like like ah and um you know I, i've got a big mouth and i've got a lot a lot of teeth it looks like but uh pete would go off the set and go down and check check that rush you know that that take yeah and he'd look at it and then he'd come back and he'd give everybody notes and i'll never forget pete came up to me and says um uh gino you know what what, what are you doing with it with your mouth i said well that's kind of like my my fear uh, fear attack grin kind of thing you know and he says oh it just looks like you're smiling keep your mouth shut <laughs> like, oh, okay yeah great thanks okay so the rest of the time i'm just like mm, we're doing something but it was a lot, it was a lot of fun and uh, richard and i had a blast and and everybody could tell that it was me and and uh, but with with richard and his makeup and stuff nobody could nobody knew that it was really richard he, he did the transformation uh, dominique till did his makeup and um 
and transformed him so well that, you know, yeah. even his wife, Tanya, came on set with her son, uh, Samuel, you know, he's just a couple of years old. Yeah. And, uh, you know, she was looking for, for Richard and couldn't, couldn't find him. Couldn't because find him. Yeah. <laughs> it's pretty funny. Oh, man. <laughs> now, um, you, you're kind enough to share a couple pictures as well uh, of you with um, someone else who we've, who's actually been on the channel before, and that is John Rees Davies, ah. who, of course, played Gimli. And uh, he actually recalled this story and uh, referenced this very same picture with the, <laughs> the uh, uh, cut finger prank that you played on Peter Jackson, making him think that John had sliced his finger open and you said you actually you actually still have the uh the finger casts for of john's finger i do i do i've got them in my in my cabinet in my office i've still got them <laughs> and it was funny because you know john had, you know I, of course right away when we first met and uh, we're making him up i noticed that he's missing you know the the end of his middle finger here mm -hmm. and um i said so i had asked so what happened there and he said oh he was working on his car and and all of a sudden I think that it started up and the fan just bloop, took off his oh, finger. Wow. And so I was thinking about it, you know, for a long time, I thought we got to try to do something, do something with this. And um, so I told John, I said, what do you think about the idea of, you know, letting me put an extension on your, on your stub, you know, and uh, we can cut it and maybe we can show it to Pete to give him an idea that maybe we could do something like that in one of the scenes. Like I imagine them sitting around the campfire after one of the big battles or something, and you go to go take off your gloves and then you can look at it as all oh, those bloody orcs, you know, and then, but you're so staunch that you get a knife and just, just cut the end of it off. You know, it's like, <laughs> oh just, just it. but anyway, so, but to go show, I said, you got to go scare Pete, you know, cause uh, it's, it's, it's hard to, to pull one over on Pete. But um, anyway, just like you saw in the picture there, um, I put a slice in it. And then when he bent it over open like that, and I put a little bit of blood inside there, but when he bent it over, it just, it just looked awful, you know? Yeah. And, um, so John goes over to uh, Pete and Pete's sitting in his chair on set and uh, John goes, boss, boss, look, I've had a little bit of a fishing accident today. And, uh, and Pete goes, oh, what, 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 what happened, John? And uh, John's, well, I was doing this and then the, the, the line came across and did that and he pulls it open like that. And Pete <laughs> just goes, oh, oh well, get, 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 you got to get a medic, got to get a medic. You know, and, and then we started laughing and then why, why are you laughing? And then, uh, of course, we... we, we let him let him out in, in, on the gag so it's pretty funny pete says oh he got me so it, it, it's pretty hard to get me but you guys got me you know so it's pretty funny um and in this picture you can see the lovely dominie till there uh, my great friend and great makeup artist uh who now lives in los angeles and married to uh, one of my best friends randy cook and um dominie is a uh, is, is a great makeup artist not only just with makeup and stuff but also with hair and uh, she did all of uh, all of John's uh, design for his uh, his wig and his beard and oh, mustache yeah. and all that stuff. Yeah, she did a great job. And um, yeah, we would do John. We probably put him into the makeup, you know, like over seventy times, I think. And he wow. hated every second of it. Yeah. Oh, I, <laughs> I th he yeah. might have mentioned that uh, when yeah. when we spoke to him. <laughs> I don't, unfortunately, he, he broke out into getting a reaction yeah. to the adhesives that we were using under his eyes and things. It was just, it was really terrible. And of course, we hated putting him into the makeup like that. And there were times when he had to take, you know, a, a good week off uh, just to let his skin settle uh, a bit. And um, yeah, there wasn't much we could do. Just, you know, let it let his skin heal. And, and uh, we tried all sorts of different uh, adhesives and things. Um, but it was just, he just, he had very sensitive skin. And it's also because around the eyes, that area there, the, the, the skin is quite thin and always it, it's right. quite sensitive. Yeah. But we, we got through it all. And on uh, John's last day, we gave him the, uh, you know, the last appliance and, uh, and, uh, he, we, we had a little fire going and so he happily <laughs> threw it into the fire to burn it forever. <laughs> oh, wow. Um, now, uh, you, you shared some, some more pictures. So I want, I wanted to bring up another one in particular because this is one I remember watching, Return of the King and wondering how much of this was prosthetics versus CG. And so when you sent this picture over and, you know, obviously we, we see bits and pieces and behind the scenes and everything, but um, this is one of the, the dead men of Dunharrow. Um, and I don't know, is this the King of the dead or is this just one of the soldiers? It's what he is. The King of the dead, the and King of the dead. Okay. The actor's name is uh, Paul Norell, I believe. 
uh, a local uh, New Zealand actor, and uh, is just putting the final touches on them. Um, but as you said, that there is there is a nice mixture of of, uh, of both yeah. uh, practical and digital effects that we that you see in the film. Um, especially as he starts to get angry, his skull and things really start to show through. Yeah. So that was that was that was a lot of fun, and his his costume was so cool, designed by Alan Lee. Oh, yeah. Yeah, it, it's one of uh, you know design wise one of my favorites from from the trilogy. It's just such a cool a cool look. Mm. Uh, I think we might have. There we go. We have another picture where he's returning the favor. <laughs> yes, that's right. Yes. So that's about as much uh, makeup as I like to have on my on my. <laughs> now I'm I'm curious. Um, so so your your current position at Weta. So you you spent a number of years at Weta Workshop, and now you're at Weta FX as the creative art director. Um, so what's it been like to make make that transition to more the digital side of things? Um, you know, is is there is there more in common there than than one might expect? Like for f just you know, my uh, uneducated mind thinks like, wow, that seems like a big leap to go from you know the practical to the fi to the digital. Hmm. Uh, it was, believe me, it was. <laughs> it still is, just because I'm technically challenged. Okay, um, but what had happened is. Um, while we were working on, uh, it was on the two towers, I believe it was. And um, Joe Letary, um, who runs uh, WhatFX, um, just happened to come through the workshop one particular day just to have a look around and see what we were up to. Now, at this time, what a workshop and what a digital, it was what a digital at the time, um, were two buildings back to back, basically. So every, everything was very close there. Um, but we had just finished doing the body of the actor Sean Bean, who plays Boromir. And this was the, the scene uh, of when he um, uh, gets killed. Sorry for the spoiler. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I think you're safe here. Yeah. Okay, all right. But uh, when they put him into the boat and they, they send him over the falls. And so we did this fake body of, of Sean. And we took his life cast and um, and uh, Ben Hawker, you know, sculpted the, the look to make him look. Because I think when we took the life cast, uh, Sean was a, a little bit, smiling a bit you know, so so that that wasn't a very uh, uh realistic dead look so uh, <laughs> so uh so ben had to go in and just you know fix it up a bit to make him look yeah. a bit more, more dead and um anyways um it's it's one of my favorite pieces that i think i've worked on because it, it came out looking so great and you know the hair work was beautiful on it uh, did i send you a picture of that one uh, i don't think i okay i'll have, to, no, have I to send you that one yeah i can um, edit it in yeah yeah and um Anyways, it was it came out really cool, and Joe had come over and um, he said, "Wow, that look, looks amazing." I said, "It looks, it looks so so real and so alive." I mean, he's he's dead, but he's he looks alive. You know what I mean? I said, "I know." Yeah. I said, "Well, I said, you know, it's a lot of it is because of the material that we use, which is a a silicone material, and it's very translucent like our skin." Whereas the other materials like the foam rubber and the latex and that kind of stuff, light actually just reflects off of it and bounces off of it. Uh, but when we have a translucent material like the silicone, it is like our skin and light actually absorbs into it and scatters around and, and, uh, and it gives it that illusion of, of uh, translucency. Wow. And I said, but the other trick on top of that are, is, is my technique that I came up with years ago of, of painting it. And painting it with all the veins and the freckles and and the mottling and blemishes and all that kind of stuff, and uh, to make it even look even that much more translucent. Yeah. And um, there was a technique that I did for for painting that golem that I had mentioned earlier. And um, and so what we did is that we would we would design the characters and creatures and I would paint them and we'd send them over to what a digital, which we really didn't. It was very foreign to us. We didn't really understand what happened at what a digital, you know, and, and except that they do amazing work. And uh, we didn't get get to, get to see it till we see it on on, on the film, right? And um, and Joe said, "Well, you know that that golem that you painted um, that that Peter and Fran bought off on, um, you know, we love it, and we hand it over to our texture artists uh, to for them to uh, to kind of copy and, and recreate it on the digital model." I said, "But they're having a hard time uh, trying to mimic exactly what you did." And that's when I think a little light bulb came on in Joe's head. And he said, you know, and you just explaining to me your process and everything it makes total sense. And he said, um, how would you like to learn some texture painting? 
-hmm. And I said, oh, does, does that involve a computer? He goes, yes. And I said, no. <laughs> I said, no. <laughs> Thanks very much. I said, I appreciate it. But uh, I said, Joe, I struggle with my email. And he says, oh, come on. I said, look, look, you don't even have to come to us. I said, well, we'll get a computer set up in your office and we'll even have a guy come over, a texture artist, come over and teach you the basics and stuff. And maybe in trade, what you can do is that you can, you can uh, show him how you actually practically airbrush mm. and do a bit of a trade off. And it's like, oh. And I'll never forget, Richard was there with me, and Richard goes, oh, come on, try it, come on. And it's like, all right. And I thought this was going to be a disaster. And um, so they came and set up a computer, and uh, this gentleman by the name of Sergei, Sergei Nezhubov, a uh, Russian uh, texture artist. And um, this is years ago now. And, um, and back then, Sergei is still with us and works with us, and he's a dear friend. And, um, and back then, his English was not so good. <laughs> and uh, so I have something going great. So we're going to have a guy that doesn't speak great English is going to try to teach me this technical stuff on how to, how to texture paint. And um, but anyways, we got through it. And um, I just I never forget. I had, you know, the digital head of Gollum in the computer. I could move it around and everything. And and I could I made up all my my palette of colors and everything. I said, oh, this is kind of interesting. And I, just, and, um, I said, but the only thing that's missing are the paint fumes. There's no paint fumes. You know? <laughs> it was a healthier way to paint. <laughs> um, and I, the way that I painted it is that I just pretended that this was a silicone bust. Mm -hmm. And so I painted it with all the different layers, you know, the, the red mottling, uh, the blemishes and the veins and all that kind of stuff. And then from what I understood, once I finished that, is that it gets sent over to another group of artists uh, called the shaders. Yeah. Now, the shader yeah. artists are these magicians that can make the skin look, you know, make it look like a rock or they can make mm -hmm. it look translucent or, or any of that kind of stuff. And so I got to see that the process of, of how they were doing the, the look de development on, on the skin and everything. Mm -hmm. And I gave them pieces of the, the actual silicone so they could see it. And um, they had this cube, the digital cube, and they made it look like silicone. And they had like a light behind it shine through it. So you could see like along the edges, the, the, the amazing translucency. I said, wow, shit, that looks just like silicone, you know, but it was all digital. Yeah, and um, then they started doing all that all that stuff on on the Gollum uh, bus that I had painted, and it was just so cool, so amazing. Wow. It's just you know everybody was just blown away. So um, you know between Sergey and myself, you know we painted Gollum, and uh, you know and uh, as, as Pete said, you know he said this is going to be one of the most important paint jobs you're ever going to do in your whole career, and I think it probably probably still is one of the most. Yeah. Important. Wow. So we we talked uh, quite a bit about your. Uh, work prosthetic wise and practical effects wise. What do you have a favorite, you know, or a couple favorites that you've done now on the digital side that you know you're really fond of? Yeah, I mean, there were there were such cool characters on Lord of the Rings, of course. Um, one that pops to mind, you know, besides Gollum, um, is the uh, the fell beasts, you know, oh, uh, yeah. which was really cool and um. Because I had designed um, the paint scheme of, of him back at workshop on on the practical side, we had this huge, just half half of a, of, the, of of its head. It was cast in fiberglass, and I painted that up. But um, the stuff that came to mind because back in Arizona, uh, because we have all sorts of cool creepy crawlies and stuff, and lots of snakes and things. And I used That's to help, right. I used to raise snakes, so I, I know them quite well. But I I based the colors off of like an indigo snake and. Uh, a Western Diamondback rattlesnake, and then a few others, but uh, but I, I wanted to have it. To, I wanted it to have like a, like a bit of a blue pearlescence to it, uh, which the indigo snake uh, has, and um, and so there's on on the fell beast itself. You'll notice that there's like a, a kind of a, a white light patch coming down just below his eye, mm. and that's the part that was based on the, the Western Diamondback rattlesnake. Wow! And um, and so on the digital side, I, I I became like the liaison between what a workshop and what a digital uh, working between the two. At the time, they didn't really have a a, a creature art director per se, mm. and so I kind of became that as well as being one of the texture artists. And I'll never forget the one time when I was a uh, painting the fell beast digitally, you know, remembering what I had done before. Um, there was a, a girl who was a texture artist and she said, I says, I said, Oh, that's looking really cool. I said, um, you know, what, what maps are you using, you know, uh, for that? I, I didn't understand what she meant. I said, I mean, how are you getting those, those colors and stuff? I said, just, just paint it. And she didn't, because what they would do is that they would get photographs and things and overlay them on top of it. And, uh, and blend them in and that kind of stuff. Right. But I, I didn't know how to do any of that stuff. I just I just painted it, you know. So yeah. I just did it all all freehand, and she just couldn't grasp. Is well, how can you just freehand? Is it? 
Is that what you do? <laughs> but, um, so uh, it was it was a lot of fun. So the Fell Beast was a great one. Um, what else did I, had, I had painted? Um, uh, I don't think I worked on the Bell. I painted the Bell Rog at Workshop, the practical one, mm. the, the fiberglass. Yeah. And that one, that one was a lot of fun because I, uh, for one of the last passes, uh, inside the cracks, um, I painted it with like a, a fluorescent paint um, that when oh. we when we put a black light on it, it was glowing. You know, it oh. you know, like, kind of looked like it was it was on fire. Yeah, so that that was a lot of fun. Now um, I, I I feel like I should. I know it's not Lord of the Rings related, but I have to follow up on the point that you said you used to raise snakes. Is that right? Yeah. Doesn't everybody? I, I, not to my knowledge, I did, this is a new concept for me. I thought they just ran wild and you just tried to avoid them, you know? <laughs> They're so cute and cuddly, you know? Um, but it's, um, uh, yeah, I've always had this fascination, you know, besides apes, but reptiles. You know, at one time, you know, growing up as a kid, I wanted to become a herpetologist who's somebody yeah. who studies and uh, studies the uh, uh, reptiles and amphibians. Um, so having that knowledge and raising them like that and being around them so much is, is great because it all stuck in my, my, my head and my brain. So when I'm designing, uh, paint schemes for things, I can remember things. And, and, uh, you know, for instance, the, the rattlesnake, uh, thing for the fell beast and, and all that. So, um, did that yeah, come I mean, into play with, with, uh, then the later Hobbit trilogy, did you bring in any snake knowledge to Smaug? Uh, definitely. Yeah. And, uh, with the, the one thing, uh, Unfortunate, but a lot of people say it's fortunate, but there are no snakes in New Zealand. <laughs> oh, not, really? I didn't no. know that. It, what, the, the thing that's so bizarre about that is that we're only three hours from Australia, you know, from right. Sydney. And of course, everything there, everything there can kill you. Yeah. <laughs> there's like, <laughs> you got the most venomous snakes in the world there. And, uh, but there's, there's no snakes here. And uh, wow. there's, there's, no, there's only one uh, that is, but it's, it's stuffed. I have a stuffed uh, a rattlesnake uh, that, I, that I brought back <laughs> with me. And uh, we use that for reference all the time and uh, to look at the scales. And, um, you know, I think we used some of that stuff as reference uh, for Smaug. Nice. And, uh, but uh, he was another one that was, that was a lot of fun to work on. And I had, uh, that's when I was looking after the, the textures department. I looked after textures department for about seven years. But while we were working on, on him, on Smaug, it's because he was so big, we had to cut him up in pieces to yeah. have, you know, one person work on the, on the head. Uh, Miriam Catron uh, sculpt, uh, did, did the paint job on the head. Beautiful job on that. And um, uh, then I had, you know, one person working on on the, the tail, one person on the back, and one person on on the feet. You know that kind of stuff. Um, and it was it was it was a marvel of a job uh, because a lot of the scales and stuff all had to be hand painted. Yeah. You know, we could have used you know a bit of a, of a stamp to kind of you know. Uh, uh, duplicate it and do all that kind of stuff. But uh, my eye always goes to that stuff because it looks like it looks like what it is. Yeah. So in this case, we hand drew it, even, even though we try to get it as perfect as possible. There's nothing like doing it by hand because, you know, you're going to get imperfections in there, which is which is exactly what's in nature. You yeah. know, it's not so not so pixel perfect, as we'll call it, you know, and then right. in, the, in the CG world. Oh, that's so cool. Um, now, I'm curious, like, was there any, you know, were, were you guys when you're making smaug and we know you know when he goes to breathe fire he's got that uh that glow about him is there any similarities in technique there between what the balrog had and what smaug had i think just from the technical side and and um the the programs that they use are probably you know pretty similar yeah um but yeah i, I wasn't involved with any of that kind of stuff and it was gotcha. that was way above my head so <laughs> it, it looked cool though yeah absolutely <laughs> well um we're, we're getting short on time here. So I wanted to end with some, uh, a few rapid fire questions for you that I like to ask people middle earth related here. Uh, who would you say is your favorite middle earth character? Oh, that's like asking who's your favorite child. <laughs> it, a little bit. Yeah. <laughs> uh, well, of course, I love John the bits, you know, and uh, we got to know each other so well. Mm. Um, we would do things because, I mean, I was I was a bit of a fanboy there because of, obviously his work in Indiana Jones. Oh, yeah, uh, absolutely. And so we would do a little thing back and forth. And it's like, Indy, why does the floor move? And John would go, go, no, 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 son. It was like, Indy, why does the floor? And I would go, no, no, no. And John would go, don't tell me what to do. I did it. 
<laughs> Very funny. But, uh, That's John a pretty good answer. Part. I mean, you don't, uh, don't want to uh, hurt John's feelings, do you? No, exactly. And, uh, <laughs> um, but also, you know, who was amazing and just blew me away was, um, was uh, Vigo, Vigo Mortensen. Mm -hmm. Yeah, as, as Aragorn. Um, originally, it was going to be, I don't, I don't know if a lot of people knew, but it was going to going to be a different actor. Yeah, yeah. Going to be Stuart, Stuart, Stuart Townsend. Townsend. Yeah. yeah. And um, I think, you know, early on, Pete and Fran and, and Philippa just knew that oh, we've made a mistake here. This mm -hmm. just isn't right. And, you know, thank God for that, because uh, when Vigo came on board, I mean, he he was and is Aragorn. Yeah. You know, he just fit that part so well. Um, yeah, just incredible. I just, I just, it, it, I used to love, uh, being on set and, uh, being on set and watching him, um, do his stuff. And there was one yeah. particular time of, uh, one of my favorite scenes, um, is, uh, Boromir's death, death yeah. scene. And, um, I'll never forget we were standing, you know, uh, behind the monitors watching the scene and, uh, where Aragorn is holding him. And, you know, he says, you know, my king. And we were just all behind the, the thing, just bawling our eyes out. Oh, just man. it was so powerful. Even now, the hairs are standing up on my arms. Yeah, the same hair. Yeah. And um, but one of the things that that Peter did is that when he was editing the stuff together, um, he put a little bit together and he put um, uh, the Braveheart music to that. And that oh, was yeah. just like, oh my god, it was just so incredible. Of course, Howard Shore's, you know, music was was phenomenal as well. But oh yeah, for the first time seeing it with music and stuff, it was just like, oh, incredible. Man, now, uh, what location in Middle Earth would you most like to live? As uh, someone who already kind of lives in Middle Earth, being in New Zealand, <laughs> but of the fictional places. <laughs> The fictional places, um, I think it would probably have to be Bag End. That's a good one. Yep. That's a popular. That's a popular one. Yeah. I, I mean, is there is there a location that you would like to visit but not live? Like uh, it'd be nice to go for a day or two. Mordor. <laughs> Mordor is good. It's a bit yeah. hot there. It's, it's a bit a hot. Bit uh, toasty. Pretty, pretty pretty rugged there. Uh, and, and, uh, and, and, and of course the real places uh, as well, you know, now, um, last question, what, what, uh, race of being would you be if you were put into middle earth? I'd love to be an elf, but I'm, I'm too, too big and too wide for an elf. That's, so. what, that's what I say all the time. I was like, <laughs> I, this face is not the face of, of an elf. <laughs> uh, it's funny because my, as I mentioned before, my wife uh, Liz Mullane, casting director. When she was, she always during filming, she always has her eyes open, you know, looking yeah. for 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 people. And the elves had to have obviously a certain look to them, you know, very yeah. almost androgynous kind of look, mm -hmm. uh, and beautiful. And so, you know, she used to carry a stack of her her cards with her, and she'd go to someone, go see somebody, and she'd go and say like, you know, is it? Um, uh, excuse me, um, I'm I'm working on. The Lord of the Rings movie, and and you, you look fantastic. And if you're interested and would like to play one of the characters, you know, an elf or something, and she yeah. give them a card and stuff. So that was pretty funny. Um, but I think I think I'm probably more of a dwarf, which I was a dwarf. I was one of the dwarf lords, right? Um, yeah. In, in, in the beginning of the in the beginning of the of the the film where they talk about the, the you know the, the rings and who's getting the rings. Um, so I got to play one of the dwarf lords there. Um, unfortunately, is uh, there? I, can you pick me out? Oh my gosh! Um, oh, this is tricky. Maybe. Okay, I'm I'm cross referencing with some of your other photos. Maybe this one right here. No, that's my friend. Oh Rich, my gosh! That's my good friend Rich Mayberry. Uh, sadly, passed away last year. Bless him. Um, so is this you on the left? That's me. Okay. Yeah. I was and debating then, between those two. I was having a hard time there. And then the one in the middle is uh, Zonder, uh, Zonder, who is another uh, makeup artist, and Rich was a makeup artist as well. So this is our day to, to be the uh, Dwarf Lords. Wow. So <laughs> so in the prologue sequence of Fellowship, when they're talking about the seven rings for the dwarves, you guys are three of, three of the seven there. 
We are, yeah. And uh, there's a scene where we're, we're holding up, you know, the rings yeah. like this. And as the camera comes around, it, it passes, it it, it passes a rich uh, Mayberry, and it's just about to get to me. And then Pete cuts. It's like and then oh, he cuts. Pete. Oh come on! Like, what did I do to you, Pete? Oh. But well, maybe, then. maybe, maybe in one of the extended, extended, extended zones. Uh, yeah. I mean, the 25th anniversary is coming up. Surely he can add a couple extra seconds to get you <laughs> your your uh, shot there. I would Let's think. So. Yeah, I think. Yeah, we we need to make that happen. Come on. <laughs> <laughs> well, Gino, thank you so much for for taking the time out and uh, joining us here on the channel to chat. Uh, about your journey to to Weta and uh, the cool work that you guys do down there. I know I speak for everybody who watches my channel that we are huge fans of your work. And uh, even today, like, you know, we're we're over 20 years from fellowship. We're celebrating 20 years of Return of the King this year. Uh, gosh, those films ha hold up so well. <laughs> and like, still like... We yeah. You mentioned you mentioned Aragorn at, at Boromir's death, and like you know, you said you were getting goosebumps. I was getting goosebumps just thinking about that moment, and it just shows the magic of these movies. And you know, a huge part of that magic is the effects work that you guys have all done. So, from all of us fans, thank you so much for for all the work that you guys do to bring this world that we love, uh, bringing that to life for so many people. That's great. Thank you very much, Matt, and thank you, thank you all out there that are that are the fans. You know, we're, we're, we're just as big of fans as well. So. All right, guys. Well, thank you so much for watching. Uh, this has been uh, a great talk with Gino Acevedo, the creative art director at Weta FX with a long storied history with the wonderful folks at Weta down there in New Zealand. Uh, thank you all so much for watching and we will see you next time on Nerd of the